Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the belated first episode of Daily Shorts for 2019. Thomas here, your host as always. I suppose I could get rid of the daily part of the title of these videos, but I guess I'm stubborn about changing my mind on branding, so here we are. For this episode, I will be looking at all the finalists in the short story categories for this year's Hugo and Nebula Awards. The Nebulas will be given out on Saturday night, May the 18th, at the conference in Woodland Hills, California. I've decided I'm not going this year, maybe next year. And the Hugos, of course, will be awarded this August at the Worldcon in Dublin, Ireland. I am fully booked for that trip. Because there are a total of nine stories to cover, and I have quite a few thoughts, I'm doing this video in two parts so it doesn't run super long. So you're getting one today, Saturday the 20th of April, and the next one tomorrow on Easter Sunday. Also, I will put timestamps in the description, so if you're more interested in hearing about some stories over others, you can skip around the video as you please. Also, links to any of the stories that can be read online. There is a bit of overlap between the two ballots this year, as there usually is. But I have to say that this year's crop of short stories are some of the strangest I've ever read. And in the case of the Nebula shortlists, there has been a bit of controversy in that the final ballot appears to have been slated by a group of independent and self-published writers called 20 Books to 50K. There's some debate over whether or not what this group did constitutes slating in the same way the Sad Puppies game the Hugos a few years ago. But many of the writers this group nominated are also affiliated with the same indie publisher, LMBPN Publishing, run by two guys who also, surprise surprise, founded the 20 Books to 50K group and own the trademark. It's a connection that frankly puts the lie to the claim that this is just a bunch of scrappy little indies playing David to the Goliath of traditional publishing. It's really a self-promotion effort by one publishing house that is at best, ethically dubious. Let's just say that while it is common and accepted practice every year for eligible professionals to put together recommended reading lists and to offer up their own eligibility lists to inform their readers, there's a bit of a difference when a group puts together an organized checklist of specific works that the group is then encouraged to nominate as a group. It is at the very least log rolling, which is generally frowned upon. But what I will say is this. So far, what I've read of the 20 books to 50k nominated works are thoroughly unimpressive and unworthy of inclusion on the Nebula ballot. I get that many people don't like awards at all because they put writers in competition to be the best, when all writers ought to be encouraged to excel equally, and I respect that point of view. But if awards do matter to you, even in a symbolic way, then log rolling efforts demean their worth because it boosts unworthy works over worthy ones and reduces awards to mere promotional tools rather than as actual recognition for merit and a mark of accomplishment and prestige. All that being said, we are where we are. So let's have a look at the first four of these nine stories, shall we? The first two finalists I'm going to talk about appeared on the Fireside website, and both are fascinating for being experiments in form. And while they're successful to one degree or another in that regard, I don't know that either of them qualifies as a story per se. They feel more like creative vignettes, or at the very least ideas simply set down in writing as a, a kind of proof of concept. The Secret Lives of the Nine Negro Teeth of George Washington is another alternate history by P. J. Lee Clark, author of the terrific novellas The Black God's Drums and The Haunting of Tramcar 015, Black God's Drums also being a Hugo and Nebula finalist. Writing under his full name, Clark bases this story on an actual fragment of historical record, a note in the accounts for Mount Vernon indicating that Washington, whose dentures are nearly as famous as he is, received teeth from nine black slaves. Clark imagines identities for these nine slaves, and in so doing, he paints a fantastical past where the realms of magic and reality collide. It's a world of mermen, and sorcerers, and even extraterrestrials, and each one of the teeth imparts a bit of its owner's persona, whether in dreams or nightmares or flashes of memory upon Washington himself. It's a rich work of imagination that you'll find very absorbing if you've enjoyed Clark's other stories, 
And even though this isn't any kind of traditional narrative, it does convey the theme that there is always a, a karmic consequence, even if it isn't readily obvious, for the harms you do to others. Stet by Sarah Gailey, best known for her American hippo novellas from Tor.com Publishing, is an even bolder experiment in form, but in the end, form ultimately trumps content here, and the piece is less satisfying as a whole. It consists of a single paragraph of text in the form of an abstract for some sort of peer-reviewed journal. But the meta-narrative takes place in a series of linked footnotes that surround the text. It feels specifically constructed to be published on the web, where Gailey makes use of links and such. Although I suppose it could appear in print without losing too much of its effect. What we gather from the text is that an autonomous self-driving car has killed a small child because its software algorithms presented it with either running over a species of endangered animal, and probably it's a bird, or the little girl. And so it chose the girl. Also, it's apparent that the woman authoring this paper was the child's mother. The title Stet is a traditional proofreader's mark, indicating that a printer should ignore any prior editorial changes made to the original manuscript. I get that we're living in a time when we should be highly suspect of software algorithms. I mean, all you have to do is look at the way YouTube has been promoting extremist videos to audiences of impressionable viewers, including kids, to be wary of their influence. But I'm still skeptical of the specific trolley problem scenario presented here. After all, it seems like any car manufacturer who failed to code its self-driving vehicles to avoid hitting a human being, regardless of whatever other creature might be in its path, would be opening themselves to serious legal consequences. Not everything would necessarily be decided by an algorithm. But mostly, stat isn't really a story at all. It's a premise a sketch of an idea, a, a Black Mirror synopsis without a narrative to flesh it out. Adventurous in its conception, perhaps, but not satisfying on its own. Now onto the two Nebula finalists from the aforementioned group Slate. Going Dark by Richard Fox is, I regret to say, a bog-standard military SF actioner in which the humans of the Terran Union are shooting it out with alien invaders called the Narusha. The story is part of Fox's Ember War series, and while it can be read as a standalone, readers who aren't already fans of the series won't have much reason to be invested in the conflict, even though Fox launches us directly into several pages of Pew Pew Pew, that's not at all badly written for this sort of thing. The plot is given gravitas when Sergeant Hoffman begins to notice that the cyborg doughboys who fight in his unit, and to whom he has developed a fatherly affection, in the way of all gruff sergeants ever played in the movies by Lee Marvin, are beginning to malfunction, and he learns to his horror that they've all had built-in obsolescence from the beginning. While Fox really works to wring emotion out of all this, it's got to be said that the theme of leave no man behind, the lazy use of faceless aliens as all-purpose bad guys who only exist to be shot at, and the pathos of stalwart warfighters weeping over the men they've lost, are all military SF cliches that are about three days older than Moses. And the theme of just because they're artificial doesn't mean they're not human has been put through its paces plenty of times as well. I can think of a decent handful of military SF novels I've read that incorporate that hackneyed trope to pretty strong dramatic effect. But Fox doesn't offer anything fresh. The trope is pulled out of its drawer, dusted off, put to use, and then put back. And for a story to be worthy of a Nebula Award, whether it's military SF or any other subgenre of spec fic, it can't just follow the dots. It needs to move the genre forward artistically, forging new pathways of story, no matter how many footsteps it's followed in. A good recent example might be David D. Levine's Damage, also a Nebula nominee a few years back, in which a completely fresh spin on the concept of a military AI actually earns the emotional response from the reader that Fox is so ham-fisted about here. Military SF diehards will accept this. As I said, Fox writes decent battles, but there's nothing about it that anyone else will consider worthy of distinction. The second of these stories is just plain bad. Interview for the End of the World, which first appeared in an anthology called Bridge Across the Stars, is a prequel to Rhett Bruno's Titans Children series which I've never heard of either, but which apparently involves a human colony on Titan. 
Here, a massive asteroid is days away from ending all life on Earth. We meet genius billionaire scientist Darian Trass, who appears to have been the only person on the planet sensible enough to build a spacecraft to take survivors off the Earth. And yet even he is pushing his timeline to the last possible minute. Trass, who narrates the story in first person so that he has plenty of opportunities to tell us how awesome he is, is wrapping up his interviews with thousands of potential candidates for his colony, all of whom we are told must be young and single and experts in their various fields. For some reason, his candidate list also includes several self-made billionaires, because I guess their skills in hoarding resources will be invaluable in establishing a colony on a moon with a dense nitrogen methane atmosphere. The story treats the establishment of said colony as something that will simply come off without a hitch, so the potential risks aren't even discussed. Trass's ship will hold 3,000 colonists in cold sleep, but with fewer than six days to go before actual impact, he is only just now getting around to interviewing Frank Drayton, a world-renowned horticulturalist. Drayton is accepted, but in defiance of Trass's rule that all colonists must be single and childless, Drayton is discovered to have a little daughter whom he has caught attempting to smuggle aboard on launch day. With the clock ticking and angry mobs breaking through the security gates, Trass must make a fateful decision. Needless to say, the decision is going to be one designed to make Trass look the most heroic he can possibly look. But really, the story's most hilarious conceit is to offer up Trass as its viewpoint character with whom we are meant to sympathize in the first place. I, I suppose if you're the sort of person who idolizes Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg as capitalist ubermensch, then okay, fine. But it's hard to believe in an alleged genius whose grand plan for human survival on Titan appears to have been scribbled onto a napkin, and who insists on personally interviewing every colony applicant so that he can humble brag to us about what an act of humility it is for him to look the ones he rejects in the eye. A really good story with this premise would make characters out of a few of the rejects so we could empathize with their emotional trauma. But Bruno is only interested in building a heroic martyr narrative for Trass himself. The ship itself stretches suspension of disbelief because to get a ship so enormous it can hold 3,000 people in cryopods off the launching pad and achieving escape velocity would require absolutely insane amounts of thrust, which Bruno addresses in a hand-wavy way by describing experimental plasmatic pulse drives. The ship itself is also intended to be repurposed into the colony habitat, making me wonder how they intend to land it. But unless everyone is going to be living in each other's laps while they try to get the agriculture started to keep all 3,000 of them alive on a planet with no arable soil of its own, I'm thinking this is going to be like trying to launch the Empire State Building. But Trass has the sort of boundless confidence I suppose you'd expect from a tech tycoon who sees no problem that can't be vanquished by wealth and ingenuity and sheer force of will. And Bruno doesn't exactly intend for us to see him as a kind of Don Quixote figure drunk on his own self-mythology. It's just a given. Trass says that conquering Titan will be relatively simple, so it will be. Bruno's prose is the kind of thing I've read from many amateurs submitting to writers' workshops. It's clunky, with too many gratuitous descriptions of irrelevant physical details, and too little emotional subtext. But I suppose Dan Brown got rich writing like that, so what do I know? Still, the fact that this silly mashup of When Worlds Collide and The Cold Equations made it onto the Nebula shortlist at all is frankly embarrassing because it would not even have made it out of the slush piles of the magazines that published this year's other finalists. So those are the first four of nine stories up for this year's Hugo and Nebula in the short story category. Now tomorrow I will look at the remaining five, so be sure to be here. Otherwise, you know the drill. These are reviews. You will not always agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe. If you haven't done so, that is how the channel grows. By the way, got a ton of new subs in the last few days, thanks to Samantha over at Thoughts on Tomes. Happy to have all you new people here. I hope you enjoy what you see. Also, you can support the channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon, where recruits into Wink's army 
get little perks like getting to see some of these videos early. I want to thank all of those people for their additional support. It is greatly appreciated. I want to thank the rest of you for being the very best viewers in all of BookTube. And until I see you next time, happy reading. <laughs>